Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen here really quickly. Uh, can you guys see the slides there? We can, if you can go to slideshow. Oh, it should be in slideshow. Hmm. Hold on, let me. Hmm. Let's try this again. Uh, That better? That works. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I must have just clicked the wrong screen. I apologize. Um, like I said, I'm Josh Kurtz. I'm assistant professor of pediatrics and one of the pediatric and adult congenital interventional cardiologists. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, multi system inflammatory syndrome in children, as well as other COVID effects uh, on children. I have no relevant financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose. For the most part, children have been spared from the severe ARDS due to COVID-19. Uh, unfortunately, around April of 2020, the United Kingdom first reported on a cluster of patients with a uh, syndrome of shock, fever, and hyperinflammation after COVID-19 infection. It was only a month later that the CDC issued a national health advisory to report on cases meeting the criteria for multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And when the CDC first uh, published the results, what they found was the cases of MISC seemed to lag behind the initial surge in cases of COVID-19. When looking at this large study from the CDC, and this, this uh, excludes those published kind of simultaneously with the original New York uh, City series, what they found was those who are symptomatic with COVID-19 who later developed MISC, the symptoms presented on average 25 days later. So this seems to be a syndrome that presents three to four weeks after their initial infection, which is why uh, the cases tend to lag behind COVID initially. The median age of presentation was a little over eight years old, which is uh, older than the typical Kawasaki's patients, though initially it had presented in a similar manner. And those with more Kawasaki's like features typically were younger in the more uh, typical Kawasaki range of less than five. And these were longer hospitalizations. They were on average were seven days and these were very sick children. So there's been a lot of discussion about um, <clears throat> uh, what MISC is and what actually defines the cases. And yet there's been a lot of kind of nebulous talk of it. And so what the CDC and uh, all the uh, stakeholders got together and this is what has come up with the definition of, of MISC. It has to fit six criteria. First, these are serious illness leading to hospitalization. So this is something that has to be bad enough that, that leads uh, to an inpatient stay. Age less than 21 years old, fever lasting for greater than 24 hours, and there needs to be some laboratory evidence of inflammation. This could be one or more of the following things such as elevated CRP, ESR, procalcitonin, fibrinogen, D-dimer, ferritin, LDH, or IL-6. And IL-6 seems to be the most specific so far for the syndrome. Other things such as elevated neutrophil counts, reduced lymphocytes, and low albumin will also satisfy the criteria as some form of inflammation. At least two organ systems have to be involved, and there has to be a recent SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this can either be by PCR, antibody studies, or, or a known high-risk exposure to COVID-19 within the past four weeks. And so how do these patients present? Well, fever, as I said, by definition, they have to have fever for at least 24 hours. GI symptoms are very common with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Mucocutaneous symptoms reminiscent of Kawasaki disease, especially in the younger patients with conjunctivitis and rash. Neurologic symptoms, headache, encephalopathy, irritability, um, uh, as well as a number of others that we'll talk about later. And then some of the more concerning ones are the cardiovascular systems. And these have uh, included arrhythmias, decreased function, as well as coronary changes. And then frequently these kids prevent very sick with hypotension and even vasoplegic shock. 
And this is reminiscent of toxic so shock syndrome or even Kawasaki shock syndrome. The vasoplegic shock is just kind of a diffuse vasodilation, which leads to kind of a high output or quote unquote warm shock. Unfortunately, because these kids also frequently are having depressed function, despite being vasoplegic, uh, they actually still may be cold because they have a cardiogenic, a mixed cardiogenic and vasoplegic shock. And then lastly, they've been seeing uh, very, very high and some of the highest recorded pro BNP and troponins. And so overall, these are very sick kids. The symptoms are pretty severe. Anywhere from 74 to 80% on the big uh, case series have required PICU admission. Nearly half require vasoactive medications. 20% have required mechanical ventilation. And even upwards of 4 to 16% have required uh, extracorporeal uh, uh, support. In one study, a majority of patients actually had depressed at some degree of depressed systolic function, but only about 4% of coronary artery changes. And so this seems to be less frequent than we see in Kawasaki disease. And so when looking at the, the CDC report, this is what the cardiovascular involvement looked like. 80% of the patients with MISC had at least some form of cardiovascular involvement. Uh, about 50% had elevated troponins, nearly three quarters had an elevated BNP. And if you actually look at the scale here, this isn't just a mildly elevated BNP, but a severely uh, elevated BNP. 26% had pericarditis or pericardial fusion. And then 38% in this series uh, had at least some form of depressed function. When you break that down, while it was only 5%, there were still 5% of these patients who had severely, severely depressed function with an eject ejection fraction less than 30%. Um, the, the coronary artery changes in this case were only about 8%, so a little rarer than um, in some of the other series. And then arrhythmia was seen in 12%. And again, vasoactive support was required in nearly half of the patients, and even 4% required ECMO treatment uh, to stabilize them. In addition to the cardiovascular symptoms, there has to be at least one other uh, system involved. Most commonly, this is GI, as 90% of patients have had GI symptoms. And then the other uh, systems involved tend to show some disparities based on age. And so while hematologic involvement is very common, it's less common in the younger age group compared to uh, kind of older children and teenagers which is different than the mucocutaneous involvement, which is seen much more commonly in younger children and then becoming less frequent when you get into the teenage years, though this is still a very common involvement in all age groups in this syndrome. Respiratory involvement uh, progressively was more frequently seen as, as the children got older. Again, this is looking at compared to adults, uh, the severe ARDS in COVID has been less frequent. So as kids get older, they're more likely to, to present more like an adult and have respiratory involvement. And then musculoskeletal symptoms were more common, though still uh, less frequently seen than other symptoms as you got older. Uh, in this series, neurologic involvement was rare. Uh, though we'll talk about this UK series in a little bit where this actually seems to be the most uh, common lingering symptom is uh, some type of neurologic involvement and then uh, renal involvement seems to be pretty rare. So the goal of treatment is to decrease inflammation and improve organ function. The most treatment has not actually been directly targeted at MISC but extrapolated from other syndromes such as Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome. And especially children with KD-like features should be reassessed 24 to 36 hours after IVIG for further signs of fevers or ongoing inflammation, as you would in Kawasaki diseases. These patients may require a second dose of IVIG or an advancement to biologic treatment. So what does MIC look like in Louisville so far? We've actually had a pretty robust experience with this. Um, as of last check, which was about a week ago, we had 53 patients that met the criteria for MISC with an average age of 10.4 years, 68% uh, being male. If you look at this, we fortunately had maybe a little less severe disease than some of the bigger symptoms, but still over 60% have required ICU admission and 13% have been intubated. Uh, while this is less than 50%, still 35% have required vasoactive support and 30% have had some form of myocarditis. The one thing we have seen more frequently is coronary changes uh, compared to some of the other series. 
And then lastly, 26% of these patients have been overweight. When looking at the adult studies, um, uh, obesity has been one of the biggest risk factors for severe and poor outcomes with COVID. And looking at an MISC, this seems to be a similar, a similar trend. So it became clear early on after the New York City and UK experience that this is something that we were all gonna experience. And all the stakeholders at Norton Children's Hospital got together and came up with some algorithms and pathways uh, for patients who were suspected to have MISC on how to kind of triage these and rule them out. And so this is an example of what was uh, decided for our outpatient algorithm. And so if a patient were to come to you, um, the first thing is if they're toxic looking and look like they're in severe shock, this is something that as you would always, this needs to go to the ED, this needs inpatient admission, this needs further workup. And the MISC workup would be done as part of that. But for patients who are otherwise well appearing, don't have another explanation for their symptoms and have had a prolonged fever and one or two organ system involvements, but are not toxic appearing should begin the workup as an outpatient. And this should include those a number of those uh, lab factors that we talked about earlier, things like a CBC, CRP, CMP, ferritin, troponin, and then some form of coronavirus testing, uh, either antibody or PCR. If all these results are normal, it's unlikely that this is uh, to be MISC and further treatment would be based on what you would do in any other setting. However, if the ferritin or troponin comes back abnormal, this does raise high level of suspicion for MISC and patients should be transferred to Norton Children's downtown um, <clears throat> or to a local ED and then a RAGE transfer to, to Norton Children's so that further workup including chest x-ray, echo and EKG can be done as this is very uh, suspicious for uh, MISC. For those patients who uh, show up in the ED or get transferred to the ED or admitted, this is what the inpatient algorithm look like, looks like. And again, it is testing a wide variety of labs from uh, BNP, CBC, CRP, uh, D-dimer and fibrinogen, ferritin, the IL-6, which I mentioned is seems to be the most specific for MISC, coagulation factors and troponin, as well as coronavirus testing, the echo, EKG, and chest x-ray. Um, kids that are this sick tend to be admitted. And if most of these labs come back uh, normal or there appears to be a more likely cause, their, their infl uh, inflammatory labs are still monitored because we know that they may have early or progressive disease that just hasn't fully presented yet. For those who do have a strong suspicion of MISC though, treatment is started immediately with aspirin and IVIG. Lovenox is started with prophylaxis as this is a high uh, coagulopathic state as well as a PPI. Echo is repeated on day two to follow up for either progressive uh, progression of changes or hopefully normalizing of cardiac changes. And then further echoes are based on the cardiology service. In addition, ID, rheumatology and cardiology are all consulted right away um, for involvement as all three of these organ systems seem to be uh, highly involved in, in MISC. Um, despite early treatment, these are uh, patients are continue, continue to be watched because their disease may still progress and may actually need further therapy. And so when looking at what therapies we've actually had to use on these patients, over 70% have had IVIG, nearly 90% have required steroids, but still a large percentage of these patients have required biologic treatment. And so 32% of these patients have required anakinra and 7.5% have even needed remdesivir. And so these are high, you know, uh, high level uh, biologic agents that are not used um, without some thought prior. And so with how sick these kids present, when is it safe for them to go home? And so that was another thing that was discussed highly and uh, a kind of concrete discharge criteria was, was determined. And what this required was three to four days of downtrending inflammatory markers, consistently declining troponin that had to now be less than one, 48 hours fever-free off vasopressors and without supplemental oxygen, normalizing of their EKG. And if there was any concern for um, hypercoagulation, they needed to be therapeutic on their 10 A's uh, and would be discharged on Lovenox. If there were symptoms of cardiac failure, symptoms had to be well controlled on oral medications and there had to be stabilization or improvements in their echo. And then they needed to have close strict follow-up with their primary care provider in, uh, in 24 to 72 hours, as well as having close follow-up with cardiology. 
Again, this was kind of based on Kawasaki disease recommendations. And so the first repeat echo um, was about two weeks after uh, the initial one, or sorry, the first outpatient echo would be about two weeks after the initial one to again, look for uh, progression or evolution of the disease versus stabilization. And then further echoes was a little more variable. So with Kawasaki disease, another echo tends to be repeated at about eight weeks after the first, so six weeks after the prior one. However, in these patients who had less coronary changes and more functional distress, uh, this, uh, this time period was frequently shifted with some requiring more frequent echoes for severely depressed function uh, or others who could actually be pushed out further because their echo had already normalized. The good news in this picture is despite how sick these kids come in, the outcomes have been very good. Death has been rare with about 2% uh, mortality rates in the initial uh, US series, both the New York City and CDC series with only two mortalities in the New York cities and four in the CDC. And then the two large UK series, there was only one mortality in the first and no mortalities in the second. Um, anecdotally, despite how sick these kids are, they do seem to get uh, better. And so currently all of the NCH patients with MISC are back to baseline with normal echoes, regression of their coronary changes, and no functional impairment. I've spoken with a number of people at other centers and their verbal reports there are that all of their centers patients are back to baseline as well. Though objectively looking at uh, long-term outcomes or at least midterm outcomes, they really do seem to be improvement. And so the, the UK did a series where they prospectively followed a cohort for six months after their MISC diagnosis. And at the six month mark, 98% had resolution of systemic inflammation. 96% had normal echocardiograms, all had normal uh, pro BNPs and troponins. And of those who uh, did not have fully normal echoes, one had a stable large coronary aneurysm and one had a stable small pericardial effusion. GI symptoms were still fairly common with 13% having residual GI symptoms. But the most common, unfortunately, was residual neurologic abnormalities with 39% still having some residual abnormality. Fortunately, none had more than minimal functional impairment. And so what these abnormalities were, uh, were um, uh, dysmetria, hyper or hyporeflexia, proximal myopathies or uh, extremity weakness, abnormal eye movements, difficulty in tandem walking, abnormal posturing, upgoing planners, um, or some sensory abnormalities and 98% were back to full-time activities. Uh, one anecdote on despite how sick these kids are, I was still a fellow in Seattle when these first, uh, when the first cases of MISC were presented and so it hadn't fully been defined. And one of our first cases came in when I was on call uh, and we had actually been discussing doing an emergency ventricular assist device that night. Um, his function was, uh, had an EF of about 10% and they were ready to prep the OR until we had heard some of these reports from New York City that the patient improved. Um, five to six days after that initial presentation, he walked out of the hospital with zero residual defects and uh, a normal EF. So despite how sick these kids are, it has been very promising that with appropriate treatment, even some requiring uh, extracorporeal treatment, uh, they do recover and recover nearly if not fully. So one more uh, transitioning a little bit, I wanna talk about COVID-19 and athletes because this has been another big topic of discussion. And there's been a concern for cardiac involvement with COVID-19, especially signs of myocarditis, and what risk for sudden cardiac death that, that pretends, especially in athletes after COVID-19. The NCAA has been one of the leaders in looking at this data, and that's because they have a robust, uh, highly competitive athletic population, but additionally have extensive pre-participation screenings. And so the Big Ten published the results of their screening after COVID-19, and there were about 1,600 Big Ten athletes who developed COVID-19, whether that was symptomatic or with a positive test. All of them required cardiac MRI prior to return to play. And what they found was only about 2.3% had some evidence of myocarditis, either clinically or by MRI. Of those, only about a quarter, it was 0.6% of those were actually clinically case clinical cases of myocarditis. So most of these were subclinical, only noticed on high screening tests or high diagnostic tests. Another big study from the NCAA looked uh, from 42 colleges looking at over 3,000 athletes that tested positive for COVID found that there was only 0.7% uh, uh, found to have COVID related heart involvement. And there was only one cardiac event in this entire uh, population. And that was actually thought to be unrelated to COVID. 
Additionally, there have been some smaller college studies looking at CMR that found no uh, abnormalities after COVID. And so based on this data, the consensus statements all agree that athletes with asymptomatic or mild COVID-19 do not need further testing prior to return to play. However, that, that doesn't mean that they don't need any evaluation. Um, I'll talk about the Kentucky Medical Association uh, recommendations in a little bit, but these patients should pretty much ju just require pre-participation screening as any would prior to returning to athletics. And like I said, these studies in the college athletes have shown that safe return to play is possible, but it does require tiered screening for those with more than mild symptoms as those are gonna require a more extensive workup. And then one of the most important things is gonna be shared decision-making. We need to balance the risks with the social and physical benefits of athletics. Numerous studies have shown that there are not only social um, benefits, but all of the health benefits uh, in the immediate period, as well as many years down the road into adulthood and cardiovascular health based on uh, athletics as a child. And there have been other studies during this COVID period showing the risk to the uh, social and social, mental, and physical health of these patients who have been um, restricted from sports and restricted from social activities that they normally had participated in. So what the K Kentucky Medical Association has published um, their guides on sports medicine for safe return to play for middle and high school students after COVID-19 breaks this into three tiers. So the mild or asymptomatic tier is those who are asymptomatic or who had symptoms for less than four days and did not require hospitalization. They need to be 10 day, at least 10 days from their initial test or symptoms, as well as at least 24 hours fever free prior to having a possible clearance to return to play. Prior to return to play, they do need a pre-participation screening and we'll show what that looks like in a minute. And if all of this is normal, then further testing is not required and uh, consultation with a cardiologist is not necessary. However, when you start getting into the moderate symptom group, and this is those who had symptoms and fevers for more than four days or who required hospitalization, but not in the ICU, then it does require a little more thought. And so this requires that the patient be not only 10 days from initial symptoms, but 10 days um, from their final symptoms. So they have to be 10 days symptom free off any fever reducing medications. So even if they've been symptom free for 12 days, but they were on um, uh, antipyretics for some of that time, that time does not count. They then again need a pre-participation uh, screening. And at this point, there is some recommendation that there may um, be at least a consultation with a cardiologist. And this may just be calling to get an EKG read or something like that. And then the final group is those with severe symptoms. And these are the patients who had MISC or required ICU stay. And these are the patients who do need some uh, form of restriction. Their recommendation right now is restriction for three to six months, and then do require consult with a cardiologist prior to clearance after this time period when they've been symptom free for three to six months. So after uh, clearance, the recommendation is not to go straight back to former activities but to have a gradual return to, to play similar to during, uh, similar to what the pro concussion protocols look like now. And these start with limited light activity for the first few days. And this progressively gets um, more, more intense and longer over the course of about a week until um, athletes reach their baseline level of activity. If at any point during this progression, they develop symptoms, they need to stop activity again again go back for reevaluation and go back in stages. Um, and so they aren't able, if this happened during stage two, they can't then come back right at stage two, but actually have to go back and pass stage one again before they can progress. Uh, on the um, Kentucky Medical Association and Kentucky High School Athletic Association websites, this is their official uh, return to play form. And if you look at it, it basically is all the things we just talked about. And so these need to be, ten it's, uh, basically certifying that they've been 10 days uh, symptom free, uh, symptoms were mild, or if they were moderate, they've been uh, away from symptoms for 10 days. Uh, they were never, they were not hospitalized, and they have not had any of these uh, heart related symptoms, especially during activity. And then one last thing I want to touch on, and I'd be remiss if I ignored this, because this has been in the news a lot lately as well, and that's vaccination and myocarditis. 
Um, in addition to the VA ERS reports and some news reports, there have been two published case series of young men with myocarditis after the vaccination. This has most frequently happened after the second dose of the mRNA vaccines. In these two case series, one from Israel and one from uh, the US, there have been a combined 13 cases. All of them were males. Fortunately, there were no serious cases and all resolved quickly but most did require treatment either with an NSAID, IVIG, or steroids. And this is something that's come into Louisville. Um, we've seen one patient so far with this. Fortunately, they completely recovered. It was only mild disease, um, but it was uh, shortly after their second dose of uh, an mRNA vaccine. And then what happens to all these MISC patients or severe COVID patients after they get discharged from the hospital? So we've actually developed a multidisciplinary clinic involving cardiology, rheumatology, and infectious disease, which we've uh, deemed our MISC clinic. It meets every Monday afternoon. Um, and so if you have any questions about this clinic or if you have a patient who you think should be involved um, or just wanna know what's going on with it, uh, you can contact Christy Stewart, who, who is our nurse clinician for, for this clinic at the number below. Um, I'll also mention, because uh, historically, I know there have been some problems with getting patients into cardiology, um, but our division's been growing quickly. We've added a number of physicians recently, and our current wait times are only about one to two days. Um, so if you do have any patients who you have a question on or need um, to speak with a cardiologist or get them to see a cardiologist, please let us know, and we're, we're happy to see them very quickly. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Kurt. Certainly a very timely topic. Uh, I know that you and the rest of the team have received uh, calls as well as email from across the United States. So great job on the algorithm that was created as well as all of the management that you've been doing and sharing with others. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, one of them is how long after the vaccine dose does the myocard myocarditis happen? Yeah, and it's still early in the experience. If you look at the two case series that have been reported, it seems to be pretty early within that first week. Um, you know, I think the, the kid we saw here, I want to say, was two or three days um, afterwards. Um, but this does seem to be, at least the symptomatic ones, it, it seems to be pretty early. Thank you. Uh, another vaccine question. Are the recommendations the same for myocarditis, uh, pericarditis associated with the vaccine as with the actual disease? Um, so, so in general, yes, I, I would say um, more for myocarditis, pericarditis than for MISC. And so um, we've been treating these, or again, just the one we've had, but uh, more kind of the uh, broader scale, um, all the centers who I've, uh, you know, spoken to or read some of the series that treating them, yeah, like any other myocarditis, pericarditis with, with NSAIDs, if it's more severe steroids or, or IVIG and supportive care. Thank you. Um, Another question, will you be looking at patients that were booked out several months and move them up on the schedule? Um, access has been difficult. Um, yeah, so um, if you give us a call, I'm guessing there's one or two patients you have uh, in mind for those, <laughs> let us know. We should be able to, to, to move them up. Um, uh, sometimes it may have been booked further out um, for patient preference or something, but um, I know because actually before I gave this talk, I was, I had was uh, sent an email or um, from uh, our uh, kind of the manager of our clinic saying uh, that, yeah, we've got spots within one to two days. So if someone needs to be seen sooner, we can, we can definitely get that done. We definitely do from an ops perspective. If you've been waiting uh, that long, definitely give us a call um, and we'll work the patients in. Also, we have the MSC uh, multidisciplinary clinic uh, where children are seen, um, as was mentioned earlier as well. So thank you very much for your time. Uh,